washer and dryer. And I'll put it affordable. Let me click. Hey this everybody. This is Kathy. We are getting ready. We are live at, from the family chapel. We're going to be doing chapter 11 of the book of Revelation of Jesus, the Revelation of Jesus Christ. Um, if you get signed on, let me know, and we'll get started shortly. We'll see how today goes. Hey, Maria. Glad you made it. <coughs> I know Christy and um, Amy were going to get on. Donna's on her way. Vicki is here. And Pastor David is here. I need my reading glasses because I'm having trouble seeing again today. Go ahead and get started. Let's see who else is out there. Just Maria. Excuse me. Um, chapter eleven is a. It's going to be. It should be fairly short. We'll see how it goes. You never know. God may take me down a rabbit hole or two. Um, sure. Ask any questions you may have. Share with friends and family. If you want them to join on to start a watch party or whatever. I don't even know what all that means, so whatever. <clears throat> when um, we started the book of Revelation, um, I knew it was going to take a while to get through it. I really didn't think it was going to take forever. <laughs> <laughs> there is a teacher that I listened to that took 52 weeks to go through the book of Revelation, and my intention is to do it much faster than that. Um, I do appreciate your patience over the last few weeks when I wasn't available one thing after another from being sick to being on vacation um, when, my, when my dad passed away I thank you all for your kind words for that it was a great time we had a really good time at the in Michigan at the memorial service and the, the funeral or whatever you want to call it it was more of a it was a home going we had a really good time when you get a bunch of us gilder slaves together we get a little crazy but anyway, um, so the book of Revelation, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And I just want to go back a little bit. It's not the hiding of Jesus Christ. It's not the mystery of Jesus Christ. It's, it's the revelation. And as we study this book and we use our Old Testament scriptures, um, sorry, I'm having trouble keeping, I don't know why it's tipping. Um, we use our Old Testament scriptures to help us understand what the New Testament says and what it refers to, then it, it becomes fairly easy to read, fairly easy to understand. Um, a lot of the Old Testament verses uh, apply directly to New Testament uh, scripture. <coughs> so I it, it'll help explain all of the, the craziness that we find in the book of Revelation if you go back to the Old Testament. Also, if you look at it from the Jewish historical perspective, it starts to make sense. Um, because God spoke to them through the prophets, through Moses and all of the major and minor prophets. And because of that, um, the readers of the, this book knew exactly what they were being told. Uh, we have a tendency to not study Old Testament scripture in the in depth, and that's they didn't have the New Testament then. So that's what that was what they studied. They understood it. They knew what it was God was talking about. Um, they missed the part of the, about the Messiah, but you know, we cut them a little slack on that because they're going to get it sooner or later. Um, but <clears throat> if we look at it from the perspective of Old Test of the Jewish people who knew what the Old Testament 
the new, knew the Old Testament, they would understand exactly what the New Testament was saying. Um, and that makes it a little easier if we can, we, have, we as Gentiles have a very bad habit of thinking that all of this is about us. And it's really not. It's about God's relationship with the Jewish people. And we get to go along for the ride. We've been grafted in because they rejected the Christ. And because of that, we have the opportunity to experience all that God had has for the Jewish people in our lives now. So we can't get very we can't get arrogant about this. We got, we got to understand that this is about God had for the Jewish people. It's a blessing. You know, exactly. It's promises and curses and blessings mm -hmm. and teaching and all of that was specifically for the Jewish people from the Old Testament. The New Testament was written for the church, which is what we're studying right now in the book of Revelation. Um, think for just a minute, if you look around, <laughs> look around the world now, look around us right now, it becomes very clear that we're coming closer and closer to the second coming of Christ. Our world is like a woman in labor with a, in, the pains increase in severity and frequency as you get farther in labor and we're seeing it happen more and more. There's more and more catastrophes. There's more and more pressure. There's more and more chaos. And that all of that is the, the birth pains of the new Jerusalem. And the Bible says, like it was in the days of Noah, everything's going to seem normal. Everybody's going to be living their lives, um, not worried about anything else. Really, excuse me if I cough a bunch. I only cough when I talk. Um, it's water. It doesn't help. It's, okay. <coughs> it's in my lungs. Um, so they're living their normal lives. Like today, we're all living our normal lives, and we're not expecting Christ to return at any moment. And we should be eagerly anticipating that to happen. Um, in Luke 18, 8, he says, Will he find faith on the earth when he returns? Will he find a true gospel? It's not so much faith, faith that he's looking for. He's looking for the true gospel. Um, God always keeps a remnant who are faithful. Um, in our world today, there's a lot of spirituality, but not so much faith in Christ. You know, it, there's all kinds of people that are spiritual. Um, the church today is secret sensitive, sensitive and world accommodating. We're more worried about what other people say about us than we are about what Christ says about us. And we need to get past that. 2 Timothy 3 starts out and says, But I know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. Uh, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty lovers of pleasure rather than of God, lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. You know, first it says that they're... they're they're more interested in their own pleasures and less interested in what God has to say. <coughs> what was that address again? Uh, 2 Timothy 3, verse 1 through 4. <coughs> so we know that the world around us, because we're smart people, and it's not hard to see, and we can just look around the world and find all of these things going on um, in our neighborhoods and in our cities and in our nation and, and in different countries around the world. All of this is happening, it says, in the days of Noah. Um, we're an idolatrous, idolatrous culture. We prefer to have idols than to have faith. It's easier to have an idol because then you can see something. You know, it, we're... We, we're we have a hard time getting a grasp on a holy God because of our inner, inward sin nature. And we'll get into that in a little bit. <coughs> Chapter 11, verse 1. And I don't know if I talked about this last week or a couple weeks ago or not, but I'm going to go ahead and start in verse 1. Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. 
But leave out the court, which is outside the temple. Do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. So once again, God is taking ownership. When you measure something, it's because you want to know what you own. So he's taking ownership of this, of the temple, the courts, and the people in the temple. But the outer courts, he's saying, nope, give this, don't measure this, because this is going to belong to the Gentiles. He's pushing that out. And this, remember, at this point in the scripture, the church has been raptured at this point. So he's not talking about us as believers, the Gentiles in the, in the court, at the temple. He's talking about non-believers, and it says, and they will trample underfoot the holy city for 42 months. That's three and a half years. Uh, remember, the Antichrist is going to come, and there's going to be a big war, and there's going to be uh, this false <coughs> the antichrist is going to make a false peace they're going to build the temple they're going to start sacrifices again and this is the 42 months that he's talking about in here um he said in verse three but i will but i will give power to my two witnesses and they will prophesy 1260 days closed in sackcloth these two witnesses is actually where the word martyr comes from hmm. So if we, you know, and I didn't do a Greek study. I wish I had, but um, we can, you can do that. <clears throat> but I'm going to give power to my two witnesses. And he's talking about a supernatural power, not a worldly power, not a power like the, the Antichrist has or the, the gov gov government has today. He's talking about a supernatural power that he's going to give them. And they will prophesy 1,260 days. So they're going to prophesy for 42 months. They're going to prophesy simply means to preach, proclaim, to speak forth. It's a forth telling, not a foretelling. He's not talking about some supernatural future event. They're just, they're just going to proclaim the truth of the gospel, which is what we do when we minister, when we preach. We are simply prophesying, which is telling people what God has to say. Um, they're going to preach the gospel and they're going to preach the grace of Jesus Christ for three and a half years to the Jews. Remember, he's already sent the 144,000 and a lot of people come to Christ. And a lot of people have died since then because we've had the seven seals and then we've had the six trumpets. So there's been a lot of chaos, a lot of destruction, a lot of damage, a lot of deaths in, during this previous time. And... He's telling them these people are still preaching the grace of God. They're still, he, God is still reaching out to the unsaved, even after all of the chaos and all of the stuff that has happened. It says they're clothed in sackcloth, which is made from camel or goat's hair. Now we study this in the past and it, sackcloth is used to express great distress or sorrow. The prophets of the Old Testament would clothe themselves in sackcloth and ashes as a sign of humility and mourning. Um, the Jewish people were being martyred at this point because this was the end of the end of the uh, first half, and the Antichrist has risen up and he's destroyed, he's desecrated the temple, and the the Jews are in mourning because they're like, how are we going to worship? How are we going to sacrifice? How are we going to do this when the the the, the temple has been so des desecrated? <coughs> so the the two witnesses being in sackcloth and ashes is very fitting. Now, it doesn't say ashes, but almost always they go together. Um, it's very fitting because they're bringing a message of the gospel, but also of the judgment to come. Um, if you look at it through Jewish eyes, and, and this is where I want to get more in the habit of doing that as I study, um, the defiling of the temple makes the whole mount of, of olives, the, the mount that the temple is, the temple mount, it makes the whole thing unclean. Suddenly, they can't even walk there, much less pre, uh, perform sacrifices. And it's really a big problem in a Jewish mind because they have been without their temple for decades. They've gotten their temple back, and for three and a half years, all of the sacrifices were rolling again, and everybody was happy, and God is great, and... and um, you know, we're, we're atoning for our sins and whatever else the sacrifices were for. But suddenly that has to stop. So now how will they worship? Um, the temple has to be cleaned. I'm sorry, what yeah. makes the temple unclean? When the um, Antichrist sits on the 
on the, the on the throne in the temple. Okay. Uh, <coughs> it's called the desolation of desecration. Um, the, they knew that the temple had to be set right again. It has to be cleansed. It has to be anointed. It has to be blessed again. Um, we know that when Jesus comes again, he's going to fix it. Right? It's all going to be holy again. Mm -hmm. And he will set things right. The defilement, defilement of the temple finally turns the remnants of the Jews to the Messiah. Because suddenly they're like, no one else can do this but the Messiah. Hmm. They still don't recognize Jesus. But they recognize that the Messiah has to come in order for this to continue. In order for our sacrifices to continue. So it's going to turn them away from waiting with expectation to anticipating the arrival of the Messiah. Okay. Um, in verse four, it said, these two are the olive trees and the two lampstands be standing before the God of the earth. As the olive trees and the lampstands, those are in uh, Zechariah chapter four. <coughs> a lot of prophecy in the Old Testament has a immediate fulfillment and a future fulfillment. And this is one of those that had happened right now, and then it's happening in the future. So when, when Zechariah saw this, and he saw Zerubbabel, he saw the lampstands and the olive trees, and the scripture says that he said, this is Zerubbabel, and this is Joshua. He is Zerubbabel. <laughs> it's hard to say those, those names and places. And that's an easy trouble. one. Um, he was the governor. He was the one that was in charge of rebuilding the temple after the Babylonians destroyed it. And then Joshua was the high priest at the time. So we've got the government and the religious organization, the religious uh, body to are represented here. In this, in this case, as the two lampstands. Hi, Donna. Hey. As the, as the two lampstands of the, uh, the lampstands and the olive trees. Um, <coughs> uh, they were set aside and anointed to bring revival and rebuild the temple back in Zechariah's days um, after the Babylonians destroyed it. So here are two men who are anointed by God and are bringing spiritual revival and they pave the way for the rebuilding of the temple again. Now the temple hasn't been destroyed in this case, but it has been desecrated. So they're not necessarily going to put bricks up, but they are going to have to cleanse the temple. So who are these two witnesses? Um, I've read several different story studies and several different commentators about it from every, and it goes everything from, uh, oh, see, I totally forgot of the other people because I, who I believe they are. <laughs> it's like, okay, no, that, no, no. Yes. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, me, I thought it was Moses and, and, uh, Elijah. Elijah. Yeah. And that's really what it comes back to. Maybe they're Moses and Elijah, you know, and that's kind of what, the, the scripture kind of leads in that direction yeah. and it doesn't say specifically that's who they are, but I believe they're Moses and Elijah. Um, in Malachi 4, 5, it says, I will send Elijah before the coming of the Lord. Mm. All right. Mm -hmm. um, they represent, Moses and Elijah represent the law and the prophets, just like Zerubbabel and Joshua did, the law and the prophets. These two men were fearless. They appeared at the Mount of Transfiguration as a preview of the second coming. Um, and the miracles they did are copied in Revelation. Kind of cool. Um, it says, uh, verse 5, If anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut the heaven... So that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy, which was three and a half years. Mm -hmm. And they have power over way waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. See, Moses, <laughs> love this, had the power to turn water into blood and to strike the earth with plagues. Mm -hmm. All right. Elijah is the one that shut up the heavens for three and a half years so that there was a drought in Israel. So here it is, he's doing the same thing, same again. thing again. So there's no accidents in the scripture. And if he's done it once and he does it again, it's pretty sure that he's, he's that from the Lord. <clears throat> Remember when they, uh, their deaths were are 
unexplained. Elijah was taken up into a, the heavens in a chariot, mm -hmm. right? He never actually physically died on this earth. And Moses, the scripture in Deuteronomy chapter 3 says, Moses died and God himself dealt with the body. God took the body. So did he really die? Did he, did he get translated like Elijah? We really don't mm -hmm. know. Um, there is no tomb of Moses. And that's intentional because he knew that the Israelite people who were supposed to be traveling into Canaan, they would come back here to and uh, cross the Jordan River, and they would keep coming back and worshiping Moses instead, instead of looking of, forward. Yes. All right, That's why the body of Moses didn't get to go. So it's kind of interesting to me um, that they're so similar in what they did, and, mo and the two witnesses do the same thing. So it kind of leads you to... I, I'm kind of concluding myself, and you'll have to search that out for yourselves, but I kind of am thinking it's Moses and Elijah. Mm -hmm. You know, how did how did Peter, James, and John know it was Moses and Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration? He, they had never seen them before. These guys died a long time before Peter, James, and John saw them on the Mount. Did they, you know, it's like, how did they know? Supernatural. The Holy Spirit. It had to be a supernatural, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. Just like the revealing, mm -hmm. you are the Christ, mm -hmm. that Peter was, it was, you know, Holy Spirit Holy revealed to Peter. So if that's possible for these disciples, is it not also possible for us? Yeah. yeah. For yeah. God to, the Holy Spirit to supernaturally reveal to us the things of God? Mm -hmm. I love that. Mm -hmm. It's kind of, it's kind it's of exciting. exciting. <laughs> yeah, it's like okay, okay, okay. I'm ready. I got a pen and I got a pen and paper, right? <laughs> we can pray for this. <laughs> it says many will try to harm them. Um, the judgment seals and trumpets. <coughs> During the judgment seals and the trumpets, the people of Israel know exactly where it came from. Right. Remember, it said, you know, let the heavens, let the rocks cover me up, and they, they were, refused yeah, to turn mm -hmm. to God. Right? They refused to repent. But they know where these judgments are coming from, where these judgments are coming, and the affliction uh, that's been on them. They have a violent hatred for God. Mm -hmm. They, it's it's unfathomable to me that they could hate God so much. To know where all their ancestors come from, and God delivered them, and to know that they to know the truth that for, and yeah, and not appreciate and love, and yeah, they hate the God mm -hmm. of the Bible and of the Jews. They have a complete disdain for anyone who would dare say that they're sinners that need to repent and receive Christ. You see mm -hmm. that now. Mm -hmm. We see that now. Mm -hmm. yep. You know, we we can. Um, the commentator was talking about being in a, a small Arabic. Or, um, Middle Eastern city and walking in, taking his shoes off and walking into the temple and the uh, imam in there saw him come in spat on the ground turned around and walked out and refused to engage him he had such hatred for what this man who was a missionary represented that that's how he treated him now he didn't kill him and you know that's a good thing because yeah. it could have gone that way um, these men, these witnesses are preaching the truth and they hate them. They, they hate the witnesses. They will hate us. Mm -hmm. They hate what we're saying. They hate our God. And that's where it's going to get tougher as time goes by. And that's just the people in general? I mean, this is the Jews that are Jews, in, okay. in Israel right now that the witnesses are preaching to. This is after all of the tribulations of the seals and the and five of the trumpets. It's all of this stuff. Um, the church has been raptured, so this is not the this is not the believers. They're not here. Okay. At, at this point, the scripture, the, everything that happens is turned towards convincing the Jews that they need to turn to the Lord. Um, God knows that they need protection. These men need protection, the two witnesses. So whenever other men come to attack them, they're con the attackers are consumed with fire. Um, you know, the people know that these men are causing suffering. 
with the plagues and the water and the no rain and remember all the, the water, a third of the water has been turned to blood already yes. and mm-hmm. seas have dried up and stuff. And so not having rain for three and a half years causes a serious drought. Mm-hmm. And they know that the God of the Bible is causing this to happen. And these men are instruments of God. And so they hate these two witnesses. Um, it, I, I, I have a hard time, and I imagine most of us that are listening today have a really hard time understanding that much hatred. I can't fathom hating someone or something so much. It's got to be consuming, Mm -hmm. you know? It's just difficult. All the catastrophes on earth are linked to these two men, and that's why they're so hated. Verse 7 When they finish their testimony at three and a half years, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. We talked about the bottomless pit in chapter 9. The fifth angel sounded, and a star fallen from heaven to earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit, and he opened it, and smoke arose, and out of the pit, like the smoke of a great furnace, so the sun and the air was darkened, and out of the smoke came the locusts. This is the abyss. This is, this is what this pit, bottomless pit is, is the abyss where the demons are held, the worst of the worst are held in captivity until the key is given and they're released. So this, out of this pit comes, comes a, a demonic force that takes the form of a human and kills them. Somehow he manages to overcome them because God has allowed it. Okay, because kills the, the two witnesses. Kills the saying. two witnesses. So okay. we know that they couldn't be killed unless God allowed it, right? Mm-hmm. And they know that also. So God allows them to be killed. It's the the beast refers to uh, implies a carnivorous beast like a lion or a tiger that's coming, um, but it's a man creature empowered by demonic forces. It says, and their dead bodies will lie in the street of that great city, which spiritually mm-hmm. is called Sodom and Egypt where also our Lord was crucified. And we know Jesus was crucified in Jerusalem. So he's talking about Jerusalem here, and he's comparing it to Sodom and Egypt because it's so, it becomes so evil and despicable to the Lord that he's looking at them as the same type of place. Um, and this is how far Jerusalem has fallen since then. <laughs> it was the ice maker. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Which spiritually is called, it wasn't, he wasn't saying that it's like Sodom and Gomorrah. He says spiritually because they worshiped themselves. They worshiped other gods. They worshiped the Antichrist. They worshiped the false prophet. This is who they're worshiping. And God says, I ain't going to deal with this anymore. Verse 9 said, Then those from the peoples, tribes, and tongues, and nation will see their dead bodies for three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put in graves. Now remember when the the plane struck on 9-11 and there was dancing in the streets in some Middle Eastern countries Mm -hmm. and even around around the United States, there was evil people that were excited and celebrating, Mm -hmm. right? This is going to be a party to end all parties. All of these evil people in Israel, in Jerusalem, finally see their enemy dead and they're convinced this is over right there's nothing else to come the evil people are dead we're going to leave them there for three and a half days and we're going to party and they're having a great time and it says (coughs) everyone is going to see them all around the world from every people tribe tongue and nations they'll see their dead bodies and um you know think about it it couldn't have happened until now with satellite TV. Mm-hmm. So you'll have TV commentators on there mm-hmm. talking about the dead bodies and the chaos and the fun stuff that they're doing over there. He says it's going to be like Mardi Gras. It's going to be a great big celebration, a great big party. I mean, we're talking, this is going to be a great time for the people that hate the Lord. All right? mm. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another. Christmas. Like Christmas, because these two prophets tormented all those who dwell on the earth. So I mean, we're, it boggles my mind that anyone could hate so much that this would cause them to party. Yeah, that's <laughs> now verse eleven. 
Now, mm. at, now see, three and a half days in the Middle East is pretty serious, mm. okay? Because we're talking it's hot, bloated, mm. yeah. rotting, mm-hmm. putrefaction mm-hmm. bodies, mm-hmm. right? And he says, now after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. Mm-hmm. Okay, so suddenly they're not smelly and nasty and bloated. And the, and the dancing is over. Yes, like <laughs> the party yeah. stopped. Uh-huh. A great fear fell on those, on those people who had been rejoicing. <coughs> now, there's really no record of what the witnesses are sharing, of what they're saying, of what they're telling people. Um, They ascended into heaven and all of their enemies saw them. Let me go to um, Luke 16. I love this story. I, I, I don't love the story, but it's a good story that fits here. And it's a story of the rich man and Lazarus. And there was a certain rich man, this is Jesus speaking, who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at the gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried to the angel into Abraham's bosom, and the rich man also died and was buried. And being in the torments of Hades, he lifted his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And then he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in the water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that your lifetime you received your good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now that he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all of this, between us and you, there was a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, and nor can those who from there pass to us. And then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, which he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. And Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to them, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Now, Jesus was specifically referring to themselves to himself that they're not going to be persuaded by me rising from the dead. They're not listening to Moses and the prophets. Mm -hmm. Now, some people did, obviously, because there is a remnant. There is Christians today because of this. There's Christian Jews because of this. But people are not going to respond. So here are these prophets rising from the dead. They can tell them everything that happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they're still not going to listen. Remember a couple weeks ago we talked about the hardening of our hearts and we talked about how we harden our hearts, can harden our hearts for so long that God passes judgment and it's called a judicial hardening of our hearts. He will judiciously harden the heart of the Pharaoh and at some point he will harden our own hearts as judgment. Um, These people had been living with their hatred of God and his mercy for so long that he hardened their hearts, and now it was time for judgment to come. Mm. It's too late. Yeah, they, you know, at some point gone. in all of our <laughs> lives, it's too late. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't know, we don't use signs and miracles to lead people to Christ. We, you know, <coughs> scriptures talk about <coughs> give us a sign, show us mm-hmm. a miracle, whatever. We don't use, we don't do that because signs and wonders follow the believer. Mm-hmm. They don't proceed the believer to convince them to believe in right. our, believe in our God, right. um, because then we would just be looking for signs and wonders, right. signs and miracles. We don't follow. We don't chase after miracles. We don't chase mm-hmm. after gold dust or whatever else is going on. But if we're walking with the Lord and He is using us in mir- miraculous ways, it will follow behind us. There will be healings and blessings and people risen from the dead and eyesight and hearing restored and and, and even limbs regrown uh, we know all of it is possible through our lord <clears throat> by this time the people had seen so many miracles done by the antichrist and the false prophet 
that they were jaded to miracles. So even if, I mean, even the miracle of his men rising from the dead did not convince them of a holy God. So there, I can't think of anything more substantial than that mm -hmm. to try to prove that he was a holy God. Especially when they, he, they were prophesying of God and also seeing the miracles from the Antichrist. The Antichrist. Yep. And they couldn't, they were just saying, oh, they're all together. Yeah, they're, they're, yeah, well, how, can, how could they, how could they not distinguish? Isn't that crazy? You know, mm -hmm. well, like you said, God hardened their hearts. So they their were hearts done. were hardened. Yep, they were done. And in verse 12, and they heard a loud voice from heaven saying, come to them, come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud and their enemies saw them. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would be like, uh, 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 uh. But they were still so angry. They were still so hateful. In the same hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city of Jerusalem fell. In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed, and the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. So here we have a repentance that happens finally after a catastrophe. Finally, there's a repentance in the Jewish faith, in the Jewish people. It says 7,000 people. In one commentary said that it's not 7,000 ordinary citizens. This is 7,000 high-ranking diplomats, diplomats and governors and leaders of the one-world government. Because that's what the Antichrist is setting up as a one-world government. So these were, these were, it infers leaders or nobilities. So these were the head honchos in the government, in the one world government, 7,000 of them died. Now, probably a lot of other people died then too, but the 7,000 were of, of the government. <coughs> and it was a serious blow to the one world government that the Antichrist had set up. The rest were afraid and gave glory to God, the God of heaven. That to me, that's the first time it talks about that in all of these disasters that happen. It's, it's like they never... They never get that. They never get it. Mm -hmm. And it says, the second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. And the third woe actually is the seven, seven bowls, which we'll get into next week. So then it says, verse 15, then the seventh angel sounded. I love this. I love it. I, every time it gets to the throne room, I get all excited again. <laughs> um and there, was a, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And it says the kingdoms, but it actually is only one. It's the kingdom of, the, the kingdom of this world it has become the kingdom of our Lord. The, for some reason, the translators made it plural, but in the original Greek, it's singular. The kingdom. Okay. The kingdom. Um, I'm going to scratch that little S off. Yeah, it, I thought it was kind of funny. In my Bible. <laughs> <laughs> All of this that has happened in the first 14 verses should motivate us towards holiness. Mm -hmm. It really, you know, all of, the, all of the book of Revelation should motivate us towards that. It, at least to the very least, the accountability we have to God. Going, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Mm -hmm. um, and it should also mobile motivate us to evangelize evangelism evangelize the people around us who think that this world is just going to go on forever on and on and on and there's no end and we don't need to to worry about the future we're all going to die and doesn't matter um so, you know but we need to lovingly share that gospel with them we're taught to pray thy kingdom come thy will be done mm -hmm. This is where the prayer is answered. God's mm -hmm. kingdom coming to earth. Um, his kingdom is coming. Where the <laughs> this is where the, the relief of the saints that have been crying out so long said it says in the the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And that's forever and ever and ever and ever and ever without end. All right, so it's it's more than our words describe. It said, And the 24 elders who sat before the th God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshiped God. And we learned earlier that the 24 elders are representation of the church. And so the 24 elders, probably everyone in heaven, 
all of the saints, mm -hmm. all, all of us will fall on our faces because remember the church is there, we'll fall on their faces and recognize that what we've been praying for and longing for, that God put an end to the suffering, God put an end to the, the martyrdom and, and your kingdom come, your will be done. Here it is. This is when it happens. Verse 17, and they said, we give thanks, O Lord God Almighty. And it really reads, O great and mighty Lord. The one who is and who was and is to come because you have taken your great power and reigned. And the word taken is a is past tense, but it's referring to a future event. It's it's like um it's like you're talking like it's already happened. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, we're looking at it now and but it's still coming. Mm -hmm. All right. It's he he is going to take his great power and reign. It says the nations were angry and your wrath has come. The whole idea that we can be so messed up in our wickedness that <coughs> that we, we miss the part about the anger of the nations. It, it's the whole world is angry. And we can see that now. There's so much of the world is angry. You know, I can look at people and go, why are you so angry? What mm -hmm. are you mad about? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, all right, in anger, recovery, and going through the depression and all of that, in the psychological mm -hmm. stuff, anger is unmet expectations. Mm -hmm. These people had an expectation, and because their expectation wasn't met, they became angry to the point of blaspheming and and just attacking and I mean it, it was so vicious and that's what we're experiencing now there's unmet expectations out there verse 18 and it said, goes on and it says and the time or the season of the dead that they should be judged and that you should reward your servants the prophets and the saints and those who fear your name small and great that you should destroy those who destroy the earth by and it implies by their wickedness. It, um, then the temple of God was opened in heaven and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple and there was a lightning and noises and thunderings and earthquake and great hail. And we've read that three or four times in previous mm -hmm. books of the Re Revelation. Said We are eagerly waiting the time when every knee is going to bow mm -hmm. and every tongue will confess. And it's coming quickly. Um, hey, think about this for just a second. Have you ever thought about the coronation of Christ as King of Kings and Lord of Lords? That's what they're waiting for. Mm. Right? They want to. This. This is what. The, the, the church is waiting for. The elders and all of the saints are waiting for. We want. Um, we want Christ to return and we know he's going to come and he's going to judge and he's going to put down all evil. And we know that, but on top of that is going to be a coronation ceremony that the world has never seen. We've never seen anything mm -hmm. like it. Um, no matter what coronation of the queen or king or whatever you've seen, <clears throat> this is going to be so glorious. We can't even imagine it. Um, and everybody will get to see it all at one time. Exactly. We're all going to see everybody it. See. Right now, the world is enjoying its wickedness. And it's indulging in all of the men, in every kind of evil. <laughs> They're continuing in their sin. But we are on the cusp of Christ returning. Mm -hmm. And I believe we'll see it in our lifetime. Mm -hmm. I could be wrong, but I don't think, I don't know. You know, we can go back and, um, <coughs> this, the seventh seal, the seventh, seventh trumpet shows us that we're coming to the end in verse 15 or chapter 15, verse one. It says, and then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous seven angels having the seven last plagues. For in them, the wrath of God is complete. Those are the bowls that are coming. Mm -hmm. The seventh trumpet has a proclamation 
Remember there, in the seventh seal, there was a silence in heaven for half an hour? Mm -hmm. Well, this is even more. When this seventh trumpet is sounded, all of heaven will explode in joy and praise and praising the beginning that the end, that the beginning of the end has finally come. The trumpet sounds and the bold judgments are about to come. So and they know that that's when God's wrath will be finalized. That that's the end of God's wrath. The saints in heaven know what's happening here on earth. That's kind of interesting. Did you ever think about that? You know, we think about it. We think that you know, my mom is in heaven watching that, watching out, and stuff like that. Well, this is this chapter eleven when it says. Um, What they see, the kingdoms of this world has become the kingdom of the Lord. They're seeing what happened on this earth. Hmm. Hmm. And because they can see what's happening on the earth, they're falling down in worship. Isn't that awesome? Yes. They know what's happening. They're longing for the tr public triumph of Christ. We know he's coming back and he's coming back publicly. Mm -hmm. Everybody is going to know he's here. Um, at one point, Satan tried, has tried over and over again since the fall to establish an earthly kingdom. Um, the Tower of Babel was part of his plan to become king of the world. And God gave them all different languages. He created ethnicities. Mm -hmm. He created different nations. And he sent them out and dispersed them around the world, right? Um, and because of that, no one, no one ruler has ever ruled the world. Mm -hmm. It's never happened. Mm -hmm. It's going to happen in the end times. Yep. There will be one government. It'll happen under the Antichrist. Um, Satan has already tried, but he has been ruler over this kingdom from the fall, yeah. over this world from the fall. He's never ha been able to set it up where he controls everything. He has failed to unite this world in its rebellion against God, but Jesus has called him the ruler of this world in John 12, 31. 1 John 5, 19, the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Ephesians 2, 2, the prince of the power of the air. And he has the influence of the whole world to act in, a, in one accord with Satan. But we've never had a one world government yeah. before. Yeah. Even though Satan is still ruling. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> During the tribulation, Satan will rule on this earth 1260 days, three and a half years. Um, the words have become, right? The kingdom of this world has become, have become the world, have become the kingdom of God is another past tense verb to show something that is to come. So it, it hasn't, they, they have not become yet. They are becoming. Okay. Um, I but. I wondering why I read that way. Because yeah. mine says are become. Yep. So I was wondering why I read it. It's a it's a future tense. Yep. Right. Yep. Okay. So here here it is. It said, it, but it implies that it's as good as done. Mm -hmm. It's like, um, I don't know. You take it to the bank. This you can done. take it to the bank. Yep. Right. I haven't gone to the bank yet, yep. but I, you can take you can you can count on it. <clears throat> it tells us that it's certain and inevitable that Christ will be coming. Proving God's unconditional covenant promises to his people. Once again, it's all about the, the Jews. Jews. Verse 16, the 24 elders, I went through all of this. Um, during the millennial reign, he will rule with a rod of iron. Okay, he's going to come on, he's going to come back, right? And he's going to rule on earth for a thousand years. But he's got to rule with a rod of iron. Because people are still, still going, going to be to rebellious. Mm -hmm. That blows my mind. I can't even fathom that people would still be, yeah. be rebellious. The nations were angry with a defiant rage. Man's nature is against God. Without the grace of God, we'll all know, they all know the destruction comes from him. I, I, just, I just can't imagine still fighting God during the thousand year reign. Mm -hmm. People are still going to be people, and they're still going to be rebellious. You think it's you think it's the people that at the end finally gave their life and say, "Okay, I'm going to trust in you," and you know, I'm, I'm just and, and keep. Just, I mean, we're coming back on, with him, right? Now, when he comes back, we're coming back too, and we're going to be mm -hmm. on the earth for the thousand years mm -hmm. too. Hopefully, we'll have a newer body. Yeah, <laughs> longer hair, longer hair, yeah. less weight. What's first name? What's first name? I missed it. 
What's it say? Verse 19. Some good stuff there. Oh, and then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And there was lightning and noises and thunderings and earthquake and great hail. Yeah, that we've yeah. seen all of that. But the Ark of the Covenant has not been seen has in the not temple been seen. Right since. at all. Yeah, they haven't mentioned anything. Um, since it was... Since it was destroyed. The Babylonians, right? Yeah. yeah. The, was it the Babylonians yep. that well, stole they it? They destroyed it, yep. It, mm. Darius? They, it disappeared. It's disappeared, and they, you know, every once in a while they think it's... So, it so Yeah. Mm -hmm. so it, because it's in heaven. Yep. And we're going to... Heaven's going to open, and the people yep. on earth are going to see heaven. Yeah. And once again, lightnings and noises and thunders. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. Which is all indicative, indicative of God's the power. power. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. and his... Hey guys, I'm trying to get your attention again. Yes. <laughs> Listen to me. <laughs> awesome, Donna. Um, <laughs> we have... Was it one of our... Was it Haley or somebody? It was Janet. Janet? At one point... She was trying to tell her dad something, and she was up in his lap, facing him, and he reaches. She reaches up, and she's like, "This one's for me." It's <laughs> crazy. My nephew just says, "I go into the bathroom where Toby's going to the bathroom, and he tells me something." And I said, "Okay, wait, just a minute, just Aunt Donna, stop. Listen to me. Yeah. I need to wash my hands or whatever it was." He's a I, you know, and I can feel like God is doing that. He's going, yeah. listen to me. <laughs> what more is it going to take? What more, what more do I have to do? <laughs> Please, Lord, mm. help the people that I know mm -hmm. yeah. that are in our family, that yes. I love, yes. that are in our sphere of influence, to come to see that you are Lord now and forever. Yeah. And <sighs> repent of their sins so that they can not suffer the wrath that is to come because it's coming and it's going to be ugly. Because I'll tell you what, every day I say, Lord, please forgive me because i got stuff going through this head. And it's oh. like I'm always saying, Lord, please, yeah. please you know, it, it goes me. through my head and out my mouth sometimes. I know. I know. Yeah, me too. A lot. Here in the last I have past to, week, it's like, oh. yeah. Because I know it's not So right. we're constantly we repenting. Mm -hmm. you, know, we, we, you know, and I... We, get, we keep on repenting. Quick, uh, it's not... Written space in our heads. Yeah, yeah. it's not yeah. one thing, but it's our inner man, over, and that's right. the yep. devil yep. working work on us, and, and, and 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 torturing and us. Yep. Well, I appreciate y'all that got online and have watched it over the the uh, last couple of uh, well, I guess an hour sessions. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and have tolerated us, <laughs> tolerated me for all of this time. Um, keep coming back. The Tuesday, our Fridays at two. We'll keep coming and um, sharing the word of the Lord and what He's teaching us. Love you guys and have a great week.